examples. Mark's going to talk to us uh, a little bit about um, recovery from his perspective. He's the, the national lead for recovery, the strategic lead for recovery of substance misuse in public health England. It's a real privilege to have him in. Uh, I think we could have sold tickets just on the back of him being here. <laughs> um, he's come, he, he's, he's, does any of you like soul music? If you like soul music, when, when James Brown used to come on, they always used to introduce him as the hardest hardest working man in, in, in the sort of show business, soul industry. Mark is like that to me. He is the hardest working, I guess, civil servant that I know. He puts in the miles. He's been all over the place. You speak to him and he says, oh yeah, I was in Glasgow the other day and tell you a story about Glasgow. And I, I'm impressed and now and I'm going here and I'm doing that. And you know, you just, you just get giddy thinking to yourself, this guy's got the best job in the world, but he probably um, is fed up of hotels and, and big breakfasts and all the rest of it. <laughs> Mark Gilman, everyone.
So what, I'll tell you what I'm going to do, me. I'm going to, I'm going to think my way out of this. I'm going to think my way out of addiction. I'm going to go use that brain that we saw before. I'm going to think my way out of it. Try thinking your way out of diarrhea would be my advice. <laughs> if, you're, if you're an addict or an alcoholic with the type described in 12-step literature or the type described all over the place, you only need to know one thing. Once too many and a thousand not enough. Yeah? Give it up. That's the surrender in order, to, in order to win. So mutual aid sits inside that and absolutely working together. There is no need for any kind of internecine warfare, any theological debate about the intricacies of it. All you need to know is you're better off in a meeting of smart or a meeting of AA than it be pretending to be an alcoholic than being in a pub pretending you're not. Because one's going to save your life and the other one's going to worse or waste an hour and a half of your time, but you'll get some of the best gags you've ever heard. My brother managed to pass this stand up comedy and I've never laughed as much in the rooms of our boats and all of us and smart recovery as ever the last eight years. The best gags I've ever heard. We might get around to a few of them. Let's get the Russian dolls out of the way first. Um, I don't know, I know they're obsessive with this Russian doll thing, you know. That's such a limit when you start putting these PowerPoints. I'll do I'll have another Russian doll. So, from a public health perspective, the endorsement is for a positive social network. It doesn't really matter from a public health perspective, whether it's alcoholics anonymous, narcotics anonymous, cocaine anonymous, smart recovery, or the Henley on Thames Ramblers, or the Henley on Thames Philatelic Society. As long as you're not on your own, that's the crucial thing. Do not stay on your own, because on your own, you are doomed. That's the one thing that we know in terms of the condition. What is the feature, fundamental feature of addiction? Self will run riot. Me, me, me. Poor me, poor me, pour me a drink. Yeah? Me, 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 me. Yeah? Self will run riot. You must get out of self. And it, and, and it, and it, otherwise, it will be a very painful experience. So from a public health perspective, it's a positive. The evidence is for a positive social network. The secondary evidence, but not the, nonetheless important and, and robust, is for mutual aid. Now, most of the research on mutual aid has been done on Alcoholics Anonymous, because that's one that's been here since 10th of June 1935, so we've had it for the longest period of time. But all the evidence that is derived from studies, good scientific studies of Alcoholics Anonymous, are applicable to Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous, and also to Smart Recovery, because it's mutual aid, and all the component parts of Smart Recovery are evidence-based as well. So everything that works in AA, NA, CA should theoretically work in SMART, so the evidence base is strong. So our endorsement is for the positive, I'm sorry, I'm looking back because I've seen the slides, um, is for, the, it's for the, the outer Russian doll. Does that make sense? That's the key, I could stop there, I'm not going to. Yeah? Um, not, we don't want to get involved in this, we don't want to get involved in brand X versus brand Y versus brand Z, because you don't need to worry about that. As long as you're sat in a meeting with other people, like yourself, learning how to do this recovery stuff on a daily basis, you're in the right place. If you sat on a, in a flat on your own with only Jeremy Kyle and White Side of the company, you're behind any the lines. <laughs> yeah. So who are we talking about? I'm going to rest for this one. We're talking for this morning, I'm talking about the top of that I triangle. I'm talking about those people who, who, who walk from their morning thoughts, who were driven from their bed this morning, not by a saying, no, shall I have Shall I have the lukewarm white cider? Or maybe chilled? Not bothered, as long as I'm going to get out of bed, I'm going to use, I'm going to drink, because it's the very life, but because I'm an addict, or I'm an alcoholic, and I have no choice in the matter whatsoever. Yeah? That's what I'm talking about. And there they are. The road to hell. Do you want an image for contemporary addiction in British society? It's that. The ubiquitous cobalt blue plastic bottle, £2.99, will drive away all morning thoughts and deliver you back again to the road to hell which will be paved with cobalt blue bottles. Yeah? So I've all woke up this morning, anywhere around me, I don't know how they are, you can tell by my accent, I'm a stranger, but I'll bet you in the rough part of Henley where this fellow is. You know, anyway. Somebody within, within striking distance here will have woken this morning sometime around 05.50, yeah? because that's what Alex and Alcoholics do, don't they? You know, they don't tend not to sleep in. Yeah, so, oh, what time is it? 0, 5, 50. Off Tuesday, the zone's at 6. I've got 10 minutes to wait. Get in there. I wish you need three quick. Thank you very much for an aqua on the white side. Boom. Before the papers, before he's even cut the string on the papers, morning, Jack. Yeah, yeah. Yes, the frosty Jack. No, I heard the room temperature was just nice. Thank you very much. Anyway, gets his white side and thinks, oh, this morning I think I'll have a very light breakfast. I'll have a 10 milligram blue diazepam. <laughs> uh, with my cider, of course. Um, with maybe a third of a Mars bar. Just that bit that helps you rest. 
Not the bit that makes you welcome, right? I'll just have that bit. So, 10 million hand guys are back, club, 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 a white cider, and just a gentle third of a Mars bar. Anyway, I think you're right, I'm done sorting now, everybody off. I've got enough down here, I've not been sick, the demons are on the way out. What am I going to do next? I'm going to make it till 9 o'clock till the chemist's over so I'll get the method done. Right, so where's it? Oh, timing it perfect, timing that two litre bottle to perfection from 0601 to 0859. <laughs> when the clock tips and there's 60 milligrams of methanol where's the fire in boots. So you're there outside, just by that much left, on 0858, go boosh! <laughs> genie pops out the bottle. I'm the genie of the white cider bottle. You, my friend, have got three wishes. What do you want? Um, I'll have one of these, it never runs out. Boosh! <laughs> fills up. Hang on a minute, hey, you've got two more wishes, what else do you want? Let's have two more of these. <laughs> That's alcoholic thinking. There is something fundamentally wrong with the alcoholics and the addicts thinking. So, the help one is a clarification. We're talking about addiction and alcoholism. We're not technically going to, I'm not te technically going to talk about 12-step facilitation as per the manuals, although you can Google that at your leisure. Uh, it's equally about smart, it's about getting people to a social support network, social relationships are a matter of life and death. I, this is not my opinion, this is five star, gold standard, evidence based public health research. Yeah? I'll show you the evidence in a second. An asset based community development. There is, I'm going to just skirt over this one because you'll get the slides, but just bear in mind that from a public health perspective, addiction has a much broader landscape, it's a much bigger picture, it's not just heroin, crack, white cider, benzos, the ones which we're, which we're most familiar with, but it also includes things like tobacco and, and premature death through COPD and emphysema, etc, etc, which obviously in due course we'll come on to. There's a massive epidemic of type 2 diabetes in this country, diabetes in Utah. Is it sugar addiction? What's the case? You know. Um, <laughs> Blah, blah, blah. This, all these new novel psychoactive substances, we're often now in detoxes having to take a full toxicology screen of people because they don't know what they're taking. People come for a detox, yeah, what are you using? Gear, heroin, yeah, crap, yeah, uh, white cider, more last year's white cider, yeah, yeah, benzos, oh, you better believe it, thank you very much. And uh, five of them are two quid a piece. Five of what are two quid a piece? I don't know. But it worked. I mean, how many people want one of them? The two quid a piece, I've told you. You get five for the tenner. I said, the tenner's living there. What are they? I've no idea. What do they work? What do you mean? So, listen, and these aren't, these are dedicated psychonauts we're talking about. <laughs> no. These aren't, you know, I, when, I, when I first heard about novel psychoactive substances, I'm 57 years of age, I started thinking, this is smoking banana skins again. You know, it's all that stuff you used to, used to, used to see in headshots, you know. Uh, it'll be a lot, it won't work. This stuff works. Believe me, this stuff works. Um, and of course, we've got the skunk. You know, all those debates you used to have. Is marijuana a depressant, a stimulant, or a psychedelic? It's a psychedelic if it's that. 47 times stronger than bog standard Moroccan soapstone, you know, scraggy little plants, you know. Definitely a psychedelic experience. And those of you who have tried, who've tried using marijuana to calm down. Mm. <laughs> I'm not calm anymore. <laughs> Get another bifter of that skunk thrown up here, or AK-47, or whatever, or the White Widow, you know. Uh, no real research in there, boys, you know. unless, of course, you've got the White Sign in tandem. And then, of course, which is the thing, isn't it, you know, anyway, you get the picture. There is a piece, for future reference, about the perfect storm of addiction, uh, which you can look at your leisure. Uh, Christopher Kennedy Lawford, his dad was Peter Lawford, his mum was one of the Kennedys, he coined this term, I nicked it off him. Please nick it off me, because everything's free. Uh, don't even need to use this, you take these slides, please use them as your own. But there is, a, what, from a public health perspective, in terms of the intergenerational transmission of this stuff, it tends to run in families, is one of the tragedies of it. But, and, and it tends to run in families, and it's a moot point, it's a question whether orthodox medical clinical treatment can create a firewall in the intergenerational transmission of this, but recovery can. Full recovery, and I've been privileged over these nine years to, to go to, to see Families, in fact, in one instance where I remember both kids being taken into care when I used to run Trafford Community Drug Team, those two kids are now both at university. One of them's a barrister, and if you'd have known his dad, he wouldn't have that poetry. You know. uh, but that's the magic of recovery. These were people that you would never have given a chance for their kids because they had genetic predisposition, it was in the families, they did have early experience of childhood trauma, 
and they had discovered for themselves the magic of, magic of drinking drugs at an early age, but because their parents were able to show them the example of recovery, they were able to embrace recovery very, very early, very early, and then got a life beyond the wildest dreams by doing a very simple programme on a daily basis. That's all this, it's just by the involvement with substances. Then, there's a, in terms of alcohol, there's a big issue. One of the things that's coming up from a public health perspective and, and our relationship with treatment services, which from, which from a public health perspective is getting a bit distant, to be honest, uh, I'm trying to keep it very close, but, is the working out what's wrong with you? What kind of user are you? Because I'll, I don't know Henry on times, but I'll be, won't be that genteel about 3 o'clock this morning, this morning, you know, I don't, I don't, well, uh, the nearest place. Those, those binge drinkers who turn our towns and cities into war zones, Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights. I, I'm from Manchester, I always say you can put the Betty Ford clinic in Clicking in the Gardens on a Friday, Saturday night, probably nobody would walk in because by the time they finish fighting at the taxi rank, right? and the one who's won's gone to, been, been nicked, and the one who's lost has gone to A&E, and the ones who've been watching are going for another kebab, you know, that they would never have drank if they had that 14 pints. Uh, I'm telling you, someone else has, you know. Been, been, oh, all right, yeah, don't you worry about that. People who went to bed with Marilyn Monroe woke up with Marilyn Manson. <laughs> Candidates for treatment? Probably not. <laughs> then there's heavy drinkers, people who use an awful lot, yeah, people who people who drink to the point of physical dependency. On New Year's Day morning this year, maybe on Christmas Day morning, thousands of people, probably hundreds of thousands of people in this world land will discover the magic of the morning drink. It's half past ten, of course, it's half past brand new bullet breakfast, the champions of Christmas time. Yeah. Well, if they were if they were assessed at that point, they would come across as alcoholics because they are taking more of the drug that made them rough, out of the dog, to make them better. Yeah? So they could be heavy drinkers. Are they alcoholics of the type described in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous or the basic text of Narcos Anonymous or indeed in some of the smart recovery literature? Probably not. And working out the difference is absolutely crucial. Because what do binge drinkers need to do? Get a different hobby. Yeah? Do someone else. What do heavy users need to do? They might benefit from a drink diary. It may come as a revelation to them that there are 10 units of alcohol in a bottle of Chardonnay, and two units in a bottle of, in a, in a pint of strong lager, or maybe 2.5 units. It might, they might not have known that. When they toss it all up, it might be a revelation. If you're an alcoholic, don't even waste the 99p on the drink diary. All they need to know is one's too many and a thousand's not enough. And they'll know through bitter experience that they'll find that out. What they need to do, alcohol time, is stop and stay stopped. Maybe not forever, but certainly for a period, because you've got to turn the water off to mend the plumbing. Time and time and time again, we can't get to the bottom of people who are self-medicating, often sometimes severe and enduring mental illnesses like bipolar disorder, like psychotic episodes, because they're constantly self-medicating with opiates and benzos and alcohol. But until we take that out and take the drugs out of the picture, we can't even get a diagnosis. So then, and, 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 and moreover, I'm getting rid almost foreign in my concern over the application of non-directive Rogerian counselling to, uh, <laughs> to addicts and alcoholics. How do, you think, how do you feel about that? What do you mean, how do I feel? What are you asking me for? My best thinking got me here. I think my thinking probably is not worth thinking about. <laughs> Quite frankly, you know. What are you asking me for? I ain't no Einstein. You know. And that's the other problem. Alcoholics on a control drinking program. We'll have a different idea of what one drink is. Oh, I'm down to one now, me. I'm down to one a day. The trouble is, it fills our bath. <laughs> yeah. And on a serious note, I mean, I'm going to stop this in a cul de sac moment because I've got just some recent experiences with somebody very close to us. Um, but that's dangerous. That is really, really dangerous. Because if you get it wrong the other way around and you send a heavy drinker to a meeting of AA, what's going the worst thing that's going to happen? An hour, of the, where's an hour of the time, here are a few gags, blah, blah, blah. I don't identify, get off. Try and put an alcoholic in a controlled drinking programme, could kill them. Yeah? So try and put that in but I'm under no illusions how difficult that is, but one of the big challenges to get that. Because alcoholics and addicts, behind, on their own thinking, are behind enemy lines. The number of times over the last nine years we've seen relapses from people with significant time because they've stopped going to meetings, they've stopped being at the centre of a positive social network, and they've relied back in here. They've gone in the most dangerous neighbourhood known to an alcoholic in your head. On a company, on my own. Oh, I know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to do, me! I'm only going to drink good red wine. Chateau, nothing is that. Nothing less than 15 quid. 
He's going to dress, going to dress these fur lips. That's it. That's on Friday night. Monday morning. Morning, Jack. That'll be a litre of uh, your finest white cider at room temperature. Thank you very much. And half a litre of imperial vodka. Thank you all. Why, why, oh, the best one I've heard recently, which is absolutely true. It's not on that side. Oh, classic one. I'll just drink at the weekend. Weekend starts Friday, ends Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the best one, which is absolutely true, is that true out there on the slides, yeah? I'm only, how did this one go upside down then, mate? Well, I thought to myself, I'm only going to drink real ale. Why? Because I hate it. <laughs> it's horrible. But it's alcohol. Do you know what I mean? But again, again, behind enemy lines. Positive social networks. It is worth looking briefly at the history. I'm not going to go through a of this now, but just to remind ourselves, this. Um, what we had before we had Alcoholics Anonymous on the 10th of June 1935. The outlook for alcoholics then didn't look very, look very bleak indeed. You know, I'd rather have a bottle in front of me than a frontal lobotomy. Because what you could expect then from the medical profession, this is not an anti-medical talk at all, but such wild and wonderful things in the name of medicine as gold injections, injection we go! Um, aversion therapy, Malcolm Lowry, one of my heroes, author of Under the Volcano, I managed to drink a bottle of scotch whilst being subject to aversion therapy. What a man, yeah? <laughs> and then they tried to make him eat lemons. Eat 24 lemons, get under him, quarter and make him chew on each one. Just they think of gin and tonic, yeah? <laughs> uh, and on a serious note, much worse happened to alcoholics in Nazi Germany. They were one of the first groups of people to go to the spinal solution. And remember what happened to Bill Wilson? Uh, they just flat this one when he was in the town's hospital in 1934, one of the four founding fathers of Alcoholics Anonymous. So he's in, he's in there for the fourth time, yeah? He's in the town's office for the fourth time. He's being treated by Dr. Silmouth, his, his doctor. He's had people saying to him, you know what, Bill? You've got to swear to your mother, didn't you? You know, not with a very accident. <laughs> You've got to swear to your mother. You want to look for a deeper sense of meaning. Blah, blah, blah. So he's in the hospital again. He's doing his fourth detox. He falls to his knees, prays to him, and asks for help from a God whose very existence to him is preposterous. This guy's a scientist, yeah? He don't believe in all that stuff. But something happened, something happened to him, he had a spiritual awakening. And he said, the icy intellectual mountain in whose shadow I had lived and shivered many years went and I stepped into the sunlight of the stories at last. From a fifth wave public health perspective, that's got resonance. Because fifth wave public health is interested in exploring what spirituality means in a contemporary postmodern, post-capitalist society. Yeah? Um, and that's with a very, very small S, a very small S. Um, the process, getting near the end now, you'll be pleased to hear, the process of putting all this together is threefold. There's three bits to it. So when we go to treatment, when people come to treatment, they should expect the very best biomedicine, the very best biological, medical response, clinical evidence-based response that the science and money can buy. Absolutely. Then, however, they should be introduced to some kind of psychological talking therapy, some kind of psychotherapeutic overview, so that they can begin to explore what's wrong with it. Talking to it. But then, that's not all, that's two thirds of it. Then every single person should then be assertively linked to a positive social network. So, AA, smart, both, narcotics anonymous, cocaine anonymous, something. Nobody should ever leave, I mean, you can't kidnap people, clearly. Um, but nobody should ever leave until, without us being absolutely clear that, with our, in our opinion, our professional opinion, Joe, Joanne, Jack, Janice, in my professional opinion, of 30 odd years in this industry, one thing you should not do now is go home from here and go, go on your own. Because on your thinking isn't that great. And the way you can drill with your thinking is to go with a lot of other people in a meeting of AA, NA, CA, or SMART. So go to all of them. Do not stay on your own. That would be the third of it. That's the evidence for the for positive social relationships. Hope Lundstad et al. 2010, we've known for a long, long time that your quantity and quality of your social connections, your social network, is crucial for your mental health and well-being. We've known that for time. What, we've known, what we now know, through five-star gold standard science, is that, and for men in particular, let me tell you, for men in particular, the quantity and quality of your social relationships are absolutely crucial. The defining feature of many male alcoholics and addicts, though the defining anthropological feature of their life in the three months prior to death is social isolation. They were on their own. They were on their own when they died, yeah? So, in, in summing it up, what does the evidence say about who recovers? The evidence is absolutely clear. Everyone can recover. 
There is nothing in the evidence anywhere that says this person has got a better chance than them, or this person's got no chance, whether it's a psychiatric comorbidity, a physical comorbidity, everyone can recover. Tragically, not everyone will. And anybody who spent any time near 12 step fellowships will, will have had the experience of being in hundreds and hundreds of open meetings, and somebody will come in and you think, this guy's the next Dalai Lama, he's that spiritual. And I'm not worried to be in the same, on the same continent, never signed the same room. Next thing, he's outside out there with an apple on the white cider, blah, blah, blah. Somebody else comes, sent by the courts or by the partner, doesn't understand, it, doesn't want to be there, kicking the thing, sucking the teeth, and they get it. You never know who's going to get it, so please don't try and guess, I've tried, you know. Um, and so, everyone can, not everyone will, we don't know who will, so what are we going to do? We're going to give everybody every chance. We're going to assume that everybody wants it. We might think everybody needs it, but we can't, you know, can't do it for them. So we'll assume that everybody wants it and give them every chance. And what does every chance look like? You start to see now how this starts to re repeat itself. Biomedical. Yes, there will be a biomedical response. Yes, there'll be methadone, there'll be buprenorphine, there'll be suboxone, there'll be chloriazide, epoxide, there'll be nemalphine. The blah, 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 we'll unpack our biomedical bag for you. You can have all of that, don't worry about that, you've got that. We'll do something about your psychotherapeutic stuff. Yes, we'll talk to you, we'll try and get you to understand what it is, why you do what you do. But you will also be assertively linked to a positive social network. We can't make you go, but it's our ethical, professional duty to say, we think you should. And we'll do everything to get you there. Whether it's 12 step facilitation or assertive link to smart recovery, that's what it's about. <coughs> so, almost near the end of it. So, if you're in treatment but you're socially isolated, this, this is often, often tragically what this, what's happening in terms of methadone maintenance in particular, is that people are in treatment and they're alive, and that is fantastic. There is a massive evidence base for methadone maintenance. Babies, this is the babies and bathwater moment. We don't want to lose the gains that we've made through that. Because people are alive and there's no recovery in graveyards, etc., etc., so they're alive. They're not in prison. Prisons, you can recover in prison, not a great place to do it. They're not in prison. I hope for are HIV free. But that's nowhere near the end of the story. That's nothing like the end of the story because they're still on their own. So they're still not anywhere near the solution because they need to be in this positive social network. And then we start to introduce people to notions like recovery does slowly, but drink and drugs did fast. Yeah? Because if you're an alcoholic, are an addict of the type described. Remember how I started? That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking not talking about heavy drinkers, not talking about heavy users, I'm talking about alcoholics and addicts. When they first started, they were never, in fact, I'll go as far to say now, with some confidence after nine years studying this, I'm not sure that drink and drugs were ever the problem for alcoholics and addicts. That they were ever the, in fact, they were the solution. Being born then in that perfect storm of addiction, being them at that time, that was the problem. Living was the problem, yeah? Drink the drugs with a solution. But what does it say in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous? When the drugs and when the drink stops working, now you will be in a place such as few have ever been, such as few have known. Now you will experience true loneliness. Now you will be at the jumping off point. Yeah? That, that, that social isolation in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because people who are using in that way are using to change their perception of reality. So the solution to that problem needs to have sufficient weight and depth. To, to do the same thing, but without drinking drugs, yeah? And ultimately, to be free from fear. Let's see where I'm, see where I'm going now, I'm nearly finished. Um, I'm last word to me on that, I think, yeah. Yeah, that's it, yeah, so I'll, I'll finish on this one. I don't know where she got this from, but my mum died not long after um, Titanic came out. And you know, when the, so it's, it's Titanic, it's the end of the film, the, the ship's split in half, people with accents like this have walked our way up from steerage, all to find all the seats have gone. <laughs> And they're all posh people in the six, and they all used to say. Well, I don't know where she got it from, but it, I think it's absolutely true that the quest to get people into mutual aid networks, she said, Do you know, Mark, if a seat would have come available on one of them lifeboats, you'd have been on it like a tramp on a kicker. <laughs> <laughs> and she's absolutely right, I would. I wouldn't have sat at the back thinking, mm, it's all very all right for them, isn't it? There's a seat on that lifeboat, I'm not getting in it. Why do they believe in God? <laughs> Look at her act. <laughs> He's wearing last year's trainers. You know, you know and I've, heard, I've heard on that lifeboat that the old hands have said this serenity prayer stuff, you know, or they do blah 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 blah. Listen, you're going to die! <laughs> you're going to die! Get in the goddamn rowing boat, 
we'll pick up an oar and start rowing. And when we say we'll have the ill esoteric philosophical theological debate, but in the meantime, for God's sake, get on the boat. Thank you. Thank you, Mark.